Welcome everyone and thank you for joining and your general support of UCLA. This is our second UCLA in Asia virtual event where we will be discussing global health trends in the post-COVID era. My name is Mike Burke and I oversee international activities for UCLA Health. I want to thank uh, Chancellor Block for hosting this event and I want to thank all of you for your support of UCLA and UCLA Health. Um, just quick housekeeping, as the event goes on, you can submit any questions that you might have in the Q&A or chat section down at the bottom. Um, but I'll introduce our esteemed panelists shortly after we do a state of the campus. And I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening or this morning as well. Um, before we move on or as we move on, I want to introduce Chancellor Block. Uh, who will provide a short uh, state of the campus and answer some questions. Chancellor Block. Thank you, Mike. And thanks to tonight's, or I would say tomorrow morning's panelists, depending where you are, and to everyone for joining us. You know, I'm grateful that these kinds of virtual events have helped us reach more UCLA alumni and friends throughout the world. Though I must tell you, I'm looking forward to more in-person events in the future. You know, we truly miss not being in Asia regularly and uh, we look forward to uh, more three-dimensional events in the future. So UCLA's academic year ended just two weeks ago. So it's a natural moment for us to catch our breath, look back and sort of look at what lies ahead. So, you know, reflecting on the past year, you know, I'm really proud the community came together to keep UCLA strong through a very tumultuous time for the entire world and, and certainly for Los Angeles and for our campus. You know, our students, faculty and staff managed an abrupt shift in remote teaching and work. And they did that with resilience and creativity, enormous challenge to change the way you deliver your course content for students to absorb material uh, in a new format, but uh, it all went, worked spectacularly well. You know, UCLA Health, which we're so proud of, served the needs of Los Angeles, the region, and, and beyond the region during a once in a generation uh, public health crisis. Uh, extraordinary effort on the part of our personnel and the health system to try to keep everyone safe. Uh, and we're deeply appreciative. And our faculty in all this excelled in spite of this year's challenges. As many of you know, Professor and Astrophysicist Andrea Ghez won a Nobel Prize this past fall just remarkable and, and so well deserved. You know, eight professors just from UCLA were awarded Guggenheims. That's really a record number of faculty uh, for us in one year. And we had record numbers uh, elected to national academies. So this was a great year for faculty recognition. And we had a record breaking year in terms of research funding. So I think we were gonna reach about $1.6 billion uh, in research, competitive research funding by the end of uh, this, uh, fiscal year, which end, ends uh, in a few days. So we've actually done an enormously good job in these difficult times. And the institution continues to thrive. You know, during this time uh, with good planning, we in a good financial position, uh, we were able to really remain, you know, fairly robust financially through this crisis. And that allowed us to avoid layoffs. So we we're able to maintain our employees during this time. Uh, we made major investments this year in promoting equity and improving the campus climate. So we've actually uh, redoubled our efforts to uh, improve this campus as a place that's welcoming to, to everyone. We also remained the most applied to school in the United States, and we received the most freshman and transfer applications ever in our history, an astounding 168 thousand applications for freshmen and transfer, just unheard of a few years ago. And we welcomed one of the most talented and diverse classes ever for the fall. So when you have that many applicants, you obviously can choose extraordinary uh, uh, students. And of course, many students who don't get accepted, unfortunately, are also extraordinary, but we can't accept everyone, obviously, when the numbers are that large. And, you know, not to brag, we were named by U.S. News and World Report, again, the number one public institution in the United States, which is always by U.S. News and World Report. You know, it's always nice to see. And our health system has, again, been nationally ranked one of the very best health systems in the country. So both the UCLA Health and the campus overall continues to be ranked extremely highly. Uh, 
this was actually uh, the effect of a lot of effort on everyone's part. But I really have to call out again our alumni and our donors and supporters who showed immense dedication to this campus during this trying time. And whether by participating in town halls or virtual events, cheering on Bruin teams, and I need not have to remind everybody uh, there was some exciting athletics this year, or volunteering or donating to strengthen the campus. So really the big family, the big tent of UCLA family and friends really came through. You know, one of my favorite examples of alumni engagement uh, with the campus was our engineering alumna and current astronaut, Megan MacArthur delivered a virtual commencement address from aboard the International Space Station. So that has to be nearly a first, giving a, an address to our graduating class in engineering from the space station. So looking to the fall, and LA is now really emerging from the pandemic, we'll have a lot more in-person activity on our campus and much more uh, of a normal academic year. So for the fall, we're planning about 80% of our classes will be in-person. You know, virtually all of our students hopefully will be on campus, So, but most of the classes will be in-person. We're gonna offer regular campus housing. So we're gonna probably be able to accommodate nearly everyone who wants to live at UCLA facilities. So housing will be act back to normal capacity. And our athletics and co-curricular programming should look pretty close to normal. So, and of course, this is all contingent upon our community getting vaccinated. There is simply no substitute in terms of safety to everyone getting vaccinated. And UC has mandated vaccines for all students and employees. It's really going to be important. For arriving international students, our Arthur Ashe uh, Student Health and Wellness Center will vaccinate new students starting August 1st. So safety on campus is really going to uh, be, it's going to be critical that we're all vaccinated. So even as we look forward to a return to campus, and we've been thinking about what we've learned uh, during this difficult past year and what it means to our future. And there's been some useful lessons. So one thing was some remote learning might help us serve more students. So as we think about uh, UCLA in the future, we think potentially about a little larger UCLA taking advantage of remote learning in combination obviously with in-person uh, instruction. So we're beginning to think how can we can use remote learning in the future when we're not dealing with a pandemic. We also have recognized learning doesn't have to end with graduation. And we've rolled out a host of new programs that are under the umbrella we call Bruin Promise. That is, we're going to try to reach our 500,000 alumni much more effectively, taking advantage of the te new technologies that we've developed over the past year. We're also thinking a lot about the use of campus space. You know, more of our employees will probably work at least part of their time from home, and we'll have more space on campus for other activities. So again, the future of work at UCLA is going to be, you know, a giant, uh, an exciting experiment where I think we're going to change the sort of the work uh, life balance for some of our employees in a positive way. And that's all really important. And I'd say all of us have recognized that there are some skills our students have to have in order to uh, combat future pandemics. And one is no matter what your major is in college, you need science literacy. You've got to be able to read the newspaper or, or, or articles. Uh, about biology, about vaccines, and you have to have a basic understanding of science. So science literacy is very important. You know, I'd say information or data literacy is really important. You know, there's been an awful lot of, of uh, poorly thought out arguments about, about the, uh, the particular the, our, our pandemic and about other aspects of this last year. It's really important to be able to assess the validity of data, the source of which it comes from, just have you know, more competency in understanding statistical information. And again, so information literacy is important. And finally, and we all know this, global literacy is critical. Uh, this pandemic cannot be solved in Los Angeles alone or in the United States alone. It is truly a worldwide pandemic that requires global solutions. And our students have to have that sort of international appreciation that we're all in an interconnected world and we have to all look at this, uh, look at these issues together collectively. So it's been a challenging time, but it's a time of change that gives us uh, an opportunity to be more thoughtful about how, we, how we're going to actually plan for the future. And I'm very confident that UCLA will be a stronger, more vibrant institution in the future, partly because what we have been through have given us some new insights and really built resilience in our community. So 
with all that we've been through, I'm deeply appreciative for all that you do and uh, horribly optimistic about the future for UCLA. I just think that uh, the best is in front of us. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that continuing to chat. Thanks, Chancellor Block. Um, hearing some of the incredible opportunities that came about in the past year, even, even with that challenging time is, is amazing. A lot of things that I didn't know were, were happening, hearing that we had a, a speaker from the space station, even um, amazing that that's possible. But um, I wanna go over a few questions that we had pre-submitted and see if there were any in the chat at the same time. But um, if we can start, um, can you talk a little bit more about the financial challenges that the campus faced during the past year due to COVID and how donations from Asia and the US have helped, um, potentially how alumni and donors can continue to help UCLA? Thank you, Mike. So there were extraordinary challenges this year. There, there's no doubt about it because uh, as you know, our students left campus, they left housing, there was very few meals being served on campus. It, it was challenging. You know, the way we think about this, our CFO, Greg Goldman, often uses the metaphor of a six-legged stool. And he says, there are really six sources of support for our institution. And you know, a few of those legs can get shaky and the stool can remain quite strong and quite firm because it has the six legs. And you know, the six legs, just very briefly, you know, enrollment, uh, tuition revenue. So tuition revenue is an important, as a, really a, an important component of our budget. And our students showed up, even though it was remote, uh, they didn't decide to wait a year out and take a year off. They decided to enroll. So our, the numbers of students actually enrolled at UCLA remains constant during the pandemic. So that particular component of our, of our financial picture remains strong. Our research revenues remained healthy. And as I, managed, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we're actually on our way to a record-breaking year in terms of research support. So research remained vigorous. And that's critical because that pays for so much of the infrastructure, the research infrastructure on campus. UCLA Health took a big dip, their revenues initially, as they decanted beds and got ready for the pandemic. But very quickly, they figured out how to actually continue to meet their obligations to uh, the ongoing needs of, of patient, other patients, as well as deal with the pandemic. So the revenues have recovered quite nicely uh, from UCLA Health. So there's no risk there. Philanthropy remained healthy. And here, you know, we've had some remarkable gifts this year, a $29 million gift to establish the Allen and Charlotte Ginsburg Center for Precision Genomic Medicine as an example. But many donations, donations from Asia and other parts of the world helped us with scholarships, helped with economic crisis relief for our students, uh, helped even with COVID-19 patient care. There were a lot of small donations to our health system simply to help with the pandemic. And I must say, you know, donors provided food purchase cards for our students, it's remarkable. You know, we had a number of donors that actually provided food cards so that our, we created a virtual food closet. So no matter where you were, we could send you a card and you could buy food for your, you know, yourself and in some cases for your family. So uh, our donors were extremely generous. They recognized the needs of many of our students and certainly of the institution. And those needs were really met by, by generous individuals. You know, I'd say going forward in terms of how, how uh, individuals can be helpful, again, providing support by staying engaged in the institution is, is really critical. I mean, we need to maintain our worldwide presence because that attracts foundation support and gives us the visibility and the reputation that we need. And of course, for individuals that are capable of uh, philanthropy, you know, every donation makes a difference and we're deeply appreciative for uh, everything that you do to make this institution stronger. Absolutely. Um, this, this next question is, is particularly interesting to me as well in, in my role overseeing care for international patients, but um, in, how competitive do you think the undergraduate admission process will be in the next five years, particularly for international students? So, Competition for spots at UCLA, unfortunately, has gotten ferociously competitive. And it's not something that we're particularly proud of because we'd like to have more slots for all the deserving students. But a combination, I, I would say, of institutional excellence, which is clearly part of this academic excellence, uh, the experience of being on this campus, all the opportunities that are not academic, leadership opportunities through student groups, Every piece of the campus is very attractive to, to students. So 
it's made it very difficult to get into UCLA. So there's a limited number of slots and there's increasing number of applications. So that means it's gonna remain quite competitive for the future. We are looking at ways we can expand the size of the institution. That's challenging. And we're going to need more state support to do that, but we have, we're trying to develop models where we can grow the campus some. And when I say that, I'm always hesitant because uh, geographically, this is the smallest of all the UC campuses uh, other than UCSF, which of course is a, a health campus. And that provides a real challenge. We just have limited amount of living space on the, on the campus, but we are thinking about creative ways to be able to grow the campus so that we can keep, we can keep the uh, campus as accessible as possible to all of our students. Now, as far as international students, uh, there is, and you've probably read about there, this, there is some pressure to reduce the percentage of non uh, out-of-state students, not just international, but all non-resident students. And there is probably going to be an agreement um, that we will have to reduce our total percentage of non-resident students from the current about 23% to about 18%. So that would mean a reduction in the percentage of students that are both uh, non, non-resident domestic as well as international students. That said, we also have plans for growing the institution some. So that is the net effect on international students may be very small because we'll have more, more, ap- you know, more applicants but more slots available because we've grown the institution. So uh, there's no way to uh, make this uh, a great story. It's a very competitive institution and uh, unfortunately, we can't accept everyone that is qualified. I should also mention, and this is true for international students as well, many students transfer in their third year to UCLA as transfer students. And there's international students that do that through US community colleges as well as through international universities. And that's another uh, way of becoming a, a UCLA student as well. But uh, it does bother me that it, there's been, it's been so difficult to get into our institution because I'd like more students to have the opportunity. There's certainly a lot that goes into that equation. <laughs> um, similar to this, without, without SAT scores as a key criteria, do you foresee a drop in admissions for Asian or Asian American students and why or why not? You know, I don't. Again, you know, the international student body is academically very strong. And it is true that students from Asia often have extraordinary SAT scores, as do many of our our domestic students as well. But they also have, uh, they have extraordinary applications. I mean, they have, they have good grades, they've achieved uh, a a, a great deal outside the classroom. So my sense is uh, that it will not have much impact. You know, I think we can make very good decisions uh, without SATs, obviously that was the decision made by the by the Board of Regents that they, they wanted to set aside the SATs at least for a time. And uh, we feel we can continue to attract an internationally, an international group of students that are highly uh, uh, competent. And uh, so I, I think the impact will be, uh, I, I don't think there'll be much impact actually on admissions. Makes sense. Um, shifting a little bit to yourself, uh, if you're willing to share a little, um, can we talk about your own life during the past 12 months, the pandemic? How have you been spending your free time and what's the most amazing book, blog, podcast that you've read or listened to in the past 12 months and, and or who's the most interesting person you've met in the past 12 months? So I think I've been spending more time actually in, in, in meetings because Zoom, I think all of us have found that we have more Zoom meetings than, pers- than, than in-person meetings when we're on campus. So I think I have at least 30% increased meetings. So that's the first thing I would say that my life has changed by there's more meetings, you know, lunch is eaten during Zoom now. It just seems to be a continuous meeting from, from early in the morning to late at night. So certainly there's been more contact, not all bad. I mean, I've reached people that I might not have reached actually with, with in-person meetings. But there has been other, there has been without traveling, there's been extra time to do things. So I have a hobby of restoring old tube radios and I have a basement full of old tube radios, many of which, you know, haven't been turned on in 70 years. And, uh, and it's kind of exciting when you can bring an old radio back and listen to broadcasts from a radio from the 1920s or 1930s. So I've pursued my interest in, you know, my old fashioned interest in old radios. I also decided I have to get more contemporary. So I bought a three dimensional printer and started printing three-dimensional objects, which is the other extreme from old radios to, you know, sort of -of state-of-the-art three-dimensional printing. And I've done some of that. And uh, my wife and I have caught up on old photos. 
and putting them in books. And that's been really important. So there's been hobbies, have actually more time for hobbies, which has actually been quite, quite enjoyable. You know, in terms of reading, I've done actually less reading than I should. I have read a book that I've sort of reread that I read some years ago called Those Angry Days by Lynn Olson. And the reason I reread it was because this is a time, it's written about a time in the 1930s when America was deeply divided over whether there should be entry into World War II. And there was a group of individuals in the US who very strongly believed isolationists that the US, that US should never get involved in a European war. And this was America First organization, that should sound familiar, America First, was leading the effort of very conservative and very vocal groups and it divided the nation and it was ugly. And again, it's really history repeating itself in some ways. And I thought it was just fascinating to read about a time that we often don't read about when the country was deeply divided uh, and deeply partisan. And some of the viewpoints were not so different than some of the isolationist viewpoints that we hear today in the country. And in a country now that is deeply divided and in a variety of ways, it was interesting to look back and see that, you know, that was the time we were divided. We managed to come together after that. Um, so it gives one hope. So that was one book that, uh, you know, sort of reread parts of it again that uh, I thought was fulfilling. Thank you. And thank you again for hosting. We do have a couple um, questions in the Q&A, and I think we'll be able to answer those um, uh, in the actual section. So I wanna move on to the panelists, but thank you again for hosting Chancellor Block and we'll move into the next section. Thank you. So again, our, our theme for, for, this, uh, for this Asia event, UCLA and Asia virtual event is global healthcare trends in the post COVID era. So we have an esteemed group of panelists joining us today. Uh, it's been a very challenging year that's shifted the way in which we interact with families, friends, colleagues, um, and for those of us that are on the panel, definitely our patients. Um, we really want to take this time to kind of explore how the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted the nature in which we are engaging and engaging with and treating our patients. So um, I want to take a moment to introduce the individuals that are on the panel, and then we'll go into uh, the discussion. So. First, we have Janice Spiso. Uh, she assumed the position of president of UCLA Health, CEO of UCLA Hospital System, and associate vice chancellor of UCLA Health Sciences in 2016. She is a nationally recognized academic healthcare leader with more than 30 years of experience and oversees all operations of UCLA's hospitals and clinics, as well as the health system's regional outreach strategy. Before coming to UCLA, she spent 22 years at UW Medicine in Seattle, Washington, where she was promoted from chief nursing officer to chief operating officer and health system officer and vice president of medical affairs for the University of Washington. While there, she played a major role in expanding collaborations with regional hospitals in the, and in the operational integration of two major community hospitals into UW Medicine. She was instr instrumental in leading the development of a statewide trauma system. Uh, she is active in the community leadership and served from 2016 to 18 as the LA Community Chair for Le the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Light the Night Walk, and in 2017 served as the LA Community Chair for the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women Luncheon. She has received numerous awards and recognition throughout her career, most recently being named to Modern Healthcare's Top 25 Most Influential, influential Women Leaders in 2019, and uh, Modern Healthcare's top 50 clinical leaders of 2020 in the United States. So thank you for joining uh, Ms. Fiso. Dr. Walton Lee graduated from the Medical School of the University of California in 1974 and was awarded the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Having served as a resident in ophthalmology from 75 to 78 at UCLA, he was granted a fellowship in corneal and external ocular disease during the year of 1978-79 at the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA School of Medicine. He established a Department of Ophthalmology of Hong Kong Sanatorium and Hospital, HKSH, in 1980 and has been the department head since then. Dr. Lee has also been a chair of HKSH's board of directors and the hospital's medical superintendent since 2005. He was elected chair of the Lee Shu Fan Medical Foundation in the same year. In 2013, he made a $2 million gift to establish the Walton Lee Chair in Cornea and uvitis at JSEI. 
Hong Kong Sanatorium is known to be among the finest healthcare delivery enterprise in Hong Kong and is a privately owned institution with more than 550 beds. In 2020, on behalf of Hong Kong Sanatorium, Dr. Lee signed an agreement with UCLA Health and the UCLA School of Nursing to provide advanced training to Hong Kong Sanatorium nurse leaders. Thank you also, Dr. Lee, for joining us. Dr. Jianan Wong uh, currently serves as the head of the second affiliated hospital to Zhejiang University School of Medicine as the professor and associate dean of Zhejiang University School of Medicine. Under his leadership for over 10 years as a hospital president, Sazdu has been moved up to a top ranking hospital in China. As an experienced interventional cardiologist, he spearheaded the efforts of in establishing and developing one of the biggest valvular heart disease programs in Asia and was invited to proctor TAVAR procedures in China, Asia, Europe, and South America. He has developed several CFDA approved innovative devices for valvular interventions in collaboration with engineers, cardiovascular colleagues, and manufacturers. He's deeply engaged in activities in medical, student, medical societies he currently serves as the vice chairman of Chinese Cardiology Society and the co-chairman of Congenital Structural Interventions headquartered in Frankfurt, Germany. He is the inaugural, inaugural editor-in-chief of the Journal of American Car Cardiologists uh, of Asia. And last, we have Dr. Elizabeth Ko. She is an assistant clinical professor of medicine of the David Guffin School of Medicine and the medical director of the UCLA Health Integrative Medicine Collaborative. She received a bachelor's degree in physiological science from UCLA and a medical degree from the University of Miami. She completed her internal medicine residency and chief, resident, and chief residency with a focus on primary care at Brown University. Dr. Ko completed a fellowship in the integrative medicine at the, oh, sorry, at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. Her yoga teacher training at, I believe it's Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, as well as the Medical Acupuncture for Physicians course through the Helms Medical Institute. She is board certified in internal medicine and integrative medicine and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. She sees patients for preventative care and chronic disease management, blending traditional medical approaches with integrative me methods, including nutrition, stress management, and acupuncture. She writes the national syndicated column, Ask the Doctors. So, um, I want to begin uh, with a few questions that we have, and we'll move into um, some submitted questions uh, by the uh, individuals that were invited. Also, um, I believe audience members submitted some uh, predetermined questions, and the panelists have worked some responses to those questions into their answers as well. So, starting with Ms. Spiso, in your role currently and generally from what your from your perspective what changes do you think uh, ucla health has observed about the way patients engage with their health over the past year and how are we as an organization preparing to meet those new needs and demands thank you mike and welcome everyone i would say this year we definitely saw really profound changes in how patients access their health care and overall, I think we learned a lot from that and we have a lot of good tools and technologies that will be here to stay. The first thing we noticed is that patients became much more digitally enabled and our healthcare providers also became more digitally enabled. For many years, we've always had the technology to do visits remotely using our information technology systems but we had very little interest in patients or providers of using those tools to do virtual visits. The pandemic definitely pushed us into that space. And here at UCLA Health, we went from doing 100 virtual visits a week to over 10,000. And it was just amazing to see that patients were really able to adapt and so were our, our providers. That piece I think is here to stay. The other thing that we saw from patients is that they were really willing to get care in non-traditional settings other than coming into our hospitals and clinics. We were able through a lot of the innovation to provide patients with home monitoring and home assessment tools so that they could connect with us from their home or even from their work environment and transmit information to us rather than coming in. 
So it was that combination, I think, that allowed us to really push forward and make sure we were delivering healthcare at a time of a pandemic. I think early on in the first phase, we did see a lot of patients hesitant to get any care. So we quickly worked together to do a public education campaign to remind people that there were safe ways to keep their care going. And that was really important so that we could avoid any unintended consequences of delays in care. Thank you, Janice. Um, moving on to Dr. Lee, very similar question. Um, in, and in your role overseeing Hong Kong Sanatorium, um, are there similar concerns in the greater Bay Area at your facility? Um, and what programs do you have underway to address these concerns? Well, our situation uh, for the pandemic was a little bit different. It came like a tsunami, you know, at the, uh, the, the, the first of the 2020 year. And, uh, but for Hong Kong, it sort of came in waves, you know. So we're in the fourth wave now. The waves only, well, each time would last a month or two. So the patients would uh, not come in in those days, but as with the UCLA situation, now that the cases number are under control, the patients are back. But as uh, Jonisa said, some of the relations have changed. It means that now our doctors see the same patients, will be advising them to be using home monitors, whether EKG or self monitoring the blood sugar, blood pressure, and all this sort of stuff to. Uh, uh, so they don't have to come in so often. So it's a changing uh, discipline in medicine, but, uh, but we're dealing with patients coming back in in order to, to, to instruct them. So it's quite exciting to get all these devices, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but our doctors are learning to incorporate these new technology uh, in their clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. Wong, um, also similar, looking, looking at um, Sazu, uh, Zhejiang province, and then China as a whole, are there, do you have similar um, programs in place? How, how did the pandemic affect, um, uh, affect China and, and what programs have you put in place there to, to address patient concerns? Uh <clears throat> Just like, uh, good evening and uh, good morning, uh, a lot of old and new friends. Okay, I feel so honored to have the opportunity uh, to share my, uh, my discussion with you. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, with, with the rapid development of China's economy and uh, continuous improvement of, people, of people's living standards, so, uh, the Chinese government, they raised the Healthy China as a national strategy. So great change, uh, have been taking place in people's health needs and uh, engaging ways uh, since then. Uh, also because of the pandemic last year, so people, people's demand for health has expanded from basic medical care to preventive healthy care and high-end uh, medical care. So the way patients engaging with their healthy uh, have been diversified. Uh, in the past, the patients used to uh, only have one option when they become ill and then need medical attention to so travel to a hospital. Uh, you already like to travel to a big hospital to see doctors. So with the advent of the telemedicine and the remote home monitoring system, uh, though patients could receive remote health care from the comfort of their homes, so doctors could make suggestions or even submit prescription requests uh, after a short video call, even on the mobile, so making the healthy care more efficient and better coordinated. So to meet these new needs and the demands, as a hospital, we, uh, we should actively build the telemedicine facilities with FG uh, as the core, so strengthen the relevant system, construction, and the personnel training and the comprehensive improve uh, the ab uh, ability of the telemedicine service. So in order to meet these needs of patients uh, for high quality telemedicine, 
Uh, so is it, in this regard, our hospital is well deserved the national leader achieving uh, many firsts in China, such as the first attempt of 5G remote ultrasound, ultrasound article robot, and the first 5G ambulance uh, load practice, and the first FG plus artificial intelligence ICU demonstration world, and the first strong blood transport uh, the route. So during the pandemic, we established the five smart epidemic prevention command and the control system, which won the first track of a 5G application in, in epidemic prevention and control. So organized by the Ministry of Health in China. So uh, our internet hospital is also a great success uh, since it's launched in July 27. The number of registered uh, patients has exceeded 730,000. So it conducts more than 3,400 online follow-up consultations per month, uh, provide various e-health services to more than 700,000 users per month. So during the pandemic, it provides over 70,000 domestic online consultations and 7,000 overseas. So at this 13th uh, China Health Forum, so our internet hospital was uh, selected as an excellent example of internet plus work hospital. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. All, all very um, similar themes across there where there was sort of a, there's always been this drive towards um, uh, utilizing telehealth services, um, but I guess the pandemic almost provided that platform and push to really uh, take advantage of it. Um, Dr. Ko, I'm, I'm really curious from your perspective, you wear multiple hats at our organization and probably outside of our organization, but um, in providing direct patient care, really what unaddressed needs did you notice specifically throughout the pandemic? And, and were there specific programs that, that you were able to put in place or just existing programs that you were able to leverage or build upon um, that you feel may continue as we come out of the pandemic? So as the three panelists mentioned, I want to re-emphasize the importance and value of telemedicine. Um, prior to March 2020, my practice was 100% office-based, and within days, we were operating at full speed. Um, much attention has been on the 10% of hospitalized patients um, with COVID, but let's remember that 90% of patients are managed as an outpatient by primary care physicians. So telemedicine gifted us the necessary ability to evaluate and manage these patients in a protected space without compromising the intimacy of the physician-patient relationship. So telemedicine just isn't a pandemic fad, it's absolutely here to stay. So the number one struggle that I've seen in my practice has been maintaining personal morale, self-care strategies, and psychological well-being for everyone alike, not just our patients, but also our frontline healthcare workers, um, our staff, and also our leadership. Um, thankfully, mental health providers have shifted to the telemedicine model, but unfortunately, demand for care still exceeds supply. Many of us primary care physicians, by necessity, have become de facto therapists and life coaches, too. Um, in the fall of uh, 2020, UCLA launched uh, virtual yoga therapy. Uh, classes are offered twice a week for free to the public, and we've had incredible success, and we intend to continue even in the post-pandemic era. And also, there's no question that many of our healthcare workers have experienced profound physical and emotional exhaustion. <clears throat> um, and we just completed a needs assessment survey of our frontline healthcare workers, which confirms this. And a team of us is leading an effort to craft a wellness and resiliency program, not just for this immediate time, but for the many years to come. Thank you, Dr. Ko. I would say um, these programs will continue to grow um, dramatically, definitely being taken advantage of in the past year. And um, now people understand the importance of that, uh, of mental health and mental health awareness more, now more than ever. Um, circling back to Ms. Piso, uh, what opportunities do you think the pandemic has revealed in terms of access to healthcare in LA? I think we learned a lot about needs in particularly health disparities in Los Angeles. COVID-19 pandemic really disproportionately impacted our communities of color. 
and it made us really recognize health disparities that need many different types of ways to improve not only access to care, but removing barriers that prevent people from seeking care. So we have been really focused now on launching additional initiatives that allow us to reach out to vulnerable communities throughout Los Angeles. Um, one of the initiatives we'll be bringing forward is a van that really goes to communities to look at providing some basic health maintenance and then connecting those patients to primary care physicians in our system and in other systems that can help with health maintenance and really improving the overall health status in our community. Thank you. Uh, similar question for you, Dr. Lee. What opportunities have, has the pandemic revealed in terms of access to healthcare in the greater Bay Area? Well, you know, <clears throat> with the boarding cro border crossing, uh, prevent patients from coming here as an uh, international referral institution. I think it's pretty much like UCLA. Patients can't get to you. You have to uh, reach out to them. But sometimes it's just uh, not for individual patients, but perhaps some link up with some local institution in terms of international input of expertise, you know, the patients who would like to come to Hong Kong or patients who would like to go to UCLA, for example, are usually complicated cases and they would need to have the, 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 the case history to be assessed. And those cases are usually kind of uh, complex and require multidisciplinary approach. So um, perhaps through the remote connections, Zoom meetings, we could uh, associate with the different institutions and different doctors groups to, to discuss the expertise, to share some opinions, just to see, well, what they can do if, uh, for the patient's uh, sake, for the, to, for the uh, medical advancement, what they can do in the local area, or whether it's worth uh, for them to uh, cross the border to come over to Hong Kong or to, to the US. So it's, it's these exchange platforms, I think it's going to be the, be the way to go uh, while the travel restrictions are in place. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Wong, same question. What opportunities has the pandemic revealed in terms of access in mainland China? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, as a vast country, a big country with an even distribution of healthy care resources, uh, China's successful experience in fighting the pandemic revealed that the advanced digital healthy care technologies and the strong national governance capacity so are the key to success. So telemedicine uh, the most widely used digital health care technology serve as an uh, enabler for China to achieve early detection and intervention of a suspect COVID-19 cases. Uh, it helped to contain the spread of virus and keep the society on the right track uh, during the time of lockdowns and the quarantines. Uh, so beyond the pandemic, Digital technology uh, will have a long lasting impact on the future of healthcare. Uh, we have already seen the strong prevalence or uh, presence of digital technology in healthcare, uh, such as uh, telemedicine, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality AR, virtual reality VR, uh, spatial computing, uh, real time remote monitoring, and uh, wearable devices, et cetera. So by enabling all these technologies through 5G networks, uh, healthcare system can greatly improve the access to healthcare. Uh, so the quality of care and the patient experience uh, reduce the cost of care, provide more personalized and preventive care and more. So with a solid technical foundation and a strong national governance capacity, so I believe Chinese people access to healthy care and the construction of healthy China will certainly uh, embark uh, on the fast track of development. 
think of this this article to answer. Thanks, Dr. Wong. So we had a few um, submitted questions in advance, and there's a couple that are a little bit related to, um, well, they're all pretty related to the to the COVID pandemic, but um, one that's of particular interest and, and topical right now as uh, the, the Delta variant is making its, making its way um, in different parts of the world. I'm curious, and, and this is generally for any of the panelists, but what are your what are your thoughts on the um, in, in some cases second very or second wave um, and in some other areas a third wave um, happening and how how each organization and each um, country is independently um, managing those uh, their approach to these uh, different waves. So Mike, I can start out certainly here in Los Angeles, we're monitoring the situation closely and we're working very closely with LA County Department of Public Health and the CDC so that we can stay on top of any new trends or patterns and implement additional safety measures um, as soon as we see them. All right, thank you, Ms. Biso. Well, <laughs> you know the... <laughs> Delta variant is, of course, a big concern. And from starting from the 1st of July, we're going to be stopping flights from the UK, for example. You see what's happening in places surrounding us, uh, from uh, India, even a, the pretty well controlled country before, like Australia. Uh, now at the lockdown, or Taiwan. So, and for the past few weeks, uh, the imported cases, a lot of them were D variants and from, you know, specific countries like India and, and, and UK. That's why we're stopping the flights from, uh, from the UK. So we're kind of scared of it. We don't know how well uh, uh, the vaccine is going to work against the, uh, the variant, particularly, you know, Hong Kong has, uh, adequate supply of vaccines. We have the, the, all the patients get free vaccines. They can get either the BioNTech, you know, the mRNA or, or, or the Sinovac. But uh, the, the, the local hesitancy uh, is still ongoing. So only about 20% of our population received uh, one shot and 30% um, have uh, I mean, 30% for one shot and 20% in, in about two shots. Uh, the, the global pickup makes the whole city vulnerable to these variants. So the, the protective measure is just closing down the border and, 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 and so forth. So it's, it's worrisome. Dr. Lee, I, I'm curious and like to build on that because uh, another question that actually just came up in the chat and um, an individual had submitted before was, um, do you think mass vaccination can end the COVID-19 pandemic? And um, another attendee had just asked, how prevalent is vaccine hesitation in Hong Kong and China compared to the US? And I know our vaccination rates are, are dramatically different um, in the US, Hong Kong and China. So what are your, what are your thoughts around um, vaccine hesitancy and how vaccine um, distribution can can end the pandemic. <laughs> I said we have ample vaccines. We have free vaccination. Patients and people can choose between two vaccines, and yet many people are reluctant to do this. It's you know like in April when we asked the question of UCLA of how many people die from the vaccination. And the answer from your panel was none. And just recently, the same question was asked. But here, every day, the news report that people died from heart attacks, strokes, and all this thing, uh, just because they had uh, received those uh, vaccinations. Of course, by now, the anecdotal uh, incidents of friends who you know, suddenly had a stroke or suddenly got into trouble after vaccination circulates around the city. And the very fact that we only have a handful of cases. Uh, sometimes 
days without uh, community spread. So for the population here, there is not such an incentive to get the vaccination. Although obviously, as far as we're concerned, without the vaccination, we're always vulnerable, just like uh, uh, Taiwan or, or Australia, we're always vulnerable, but the people uh, are still worried about uh, the, the getting the vaccine. But it, however, it does help with uh, uh, the, the people coming to our hospital and other clinics to get uh, coronary angiograms and you know uh, cerebral angiogram, you know, just to check up. So the, 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 the concern is it's a personal safety from the vaccine. Thank you. I'd like to understand also, um, Dr. Ko, how you might work directly um, with patients on, on messaging this information and uh, just generally your thoughts here. Yeah, so the Los Angeles rollout for vaccines has been stronger compared to other parts of the world. So um, for those age 65 and above with one dose, it's 87% by LA County data and 76% of our senior population is fully vaccinated. The numbers are less strong for age 16 plus with one dose is 67% and 58% being fully vaccinated. So there definitely is a degree of vaccine skepticism. And I think my role, our collective role as responsible academic clinicians is to show the science. That's really where we need to direct our energy to is showing the original data, the strong numbers that really show just 95% efficacy with two doses of this vaccine. Another number that I think deserves attention is the breakthrough case rate, uh, which is very, very low. So um, data from LA County of, um, as of May, 3.3 uh, million fully vaccinated LA County residents, only 0.03% breakthrough cases. And the data um, from the California Department of Health is also very similar at a rate of 0.032%. So that is really impressive data. I mean, in fully vaccinated individuals, you can't beat that rate. No vaccine has ever been 100% effective. The hope is to avoid severe critical disease. Thank you, Dr. Ko. Dr. Wong, uh, I'm curious also your thoughts. Uh, mainland China also has, has managed the pandemic so well from a contact tracing and, and managing each individual case in, uh, uh, itself. So. How has the adoption of the vaccine been um, taken there as well? Uh, actually, uh, facing the variants of virus spreading, uh, the Chinese government implemented two major ways. So one is uh, increase the, the rate of vaccination in population. So like the, our hospital, my staff, uh, uh, already 99% uh, of, of my staff uh, have received the vaccination. So in the whole country, I think the very fast increase of the vaccination rate. And the other uh, very effective way is when, uh, when, when case appear, uh, the government put a lot of resources uh, to do the case tracing, to do the epidemiology investigation, to do a lot of the PCR tests. And so uh, in do the PCR tests in people who may contact the infected person. So that's still a, they're very function well. So you know, uh, in some province, when the new case appear, but uh, some uh, very quick, just uh, isolate, isolation and uh, then less than one month, so disappear, the new case will disappear. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Wong. Unless there are any other um, final thoughts from the group, I believe we are just about out of time or it's a good time to wrap up. Um, it's very interesting hearing the different approaches that each um, organization and not to summarize too um, broadly, but um, definitely not countries because as Dr. Coe mentioned, we we in LA County, even California, even the United States take, take this um, 
have managed this pandemic very differently. And I'm sure the same is true of mainland China and of um, even Hong Kong as well. But um, still very interesting to hear how, how we're managing things and what we've learned throughout the pandemic. Um, I know at UCLA, we've, we've held uh, joint calls to learn from each other throughout this, um, and we'll continue to do so as we move forward. Um, I wanna thank the panelists for joining us and um, we have a little bit of a wrap up as well from Chancellor Block. So I want to hand it back off to him. Thank, thank you, Mike, and, and thank all the panelists. So this, this makes my point about global perspectives. And this is the great advantage of having a, a global university with friends and alumni throughout the world is that this is the type of, of challenge, a medical challenge that really requires you know, concerted efforts and, and knowledge sharing among, among many countries, many regions. So it's just heartwarming to see it all happening here. And uh, we're really thankful to our partners like Chijang and, and obviously our great uh, alumni, uh, Walton Lee. I mean, it's just, it, it is really a, a blessing to be able to have uh, such talented people come together in a forum in addition to our own great expertise here on, on campus. So want to thank all of you. I also took a look down the, the, the list of our attendees and, and Asia is really well represented. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of countries represented. So that's exciting as well. That's attracted a, a broad group of participants. So this is something that would be very hard to do in person. So again, Zoom platforms do provide some advantages for uh, these very special events. So uh, thank you all, uh, especially our panelists, but our participants as, and our, uh, our attendees as well. It's, uh, I've certainly learned a lot. Be safe. Thank you. <laughs>